Good morning. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 through 30. Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 through 30. Please stand. But I thought it necessary to send you to you, Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard. Because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. The Word of God. Please be seated. Fifteen, thirty-three, thirty-seven, fifty-five, sixty-one, and twenty-four. These were the winning numbers of the Mega Millions lottery just two days ago. And nobody claimed the jackpot of nearly $650 million. Yeah. I mean, I don't support gambling, but people often become addicted to the excitement um, of a lottery ticket or scratch-off and dream that they will win. Um, it's just a matter of time, they say. Or you don't win if you don't play. Well, the situation was no different back then. The hopes of riches placing their hope in something that they thought would last. Typically, if a first century Greek individual would uh, hope to have a shot at winning it big, they would play an ancient form of craps, that is, a dice game, made of literal bones, not just dice we call bones, but bones, like vertebrae. And whenever the shooter cast the dice, the risk taker would yell, Epaphroditus, in hopes of increasing their chances to win. It was a common phrase, meaning favorite of Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love and luck, supposedly, known as Venus in Roman mythology. It came to mean loving, handsome, or charming, which leads us all to the Christian in this chapter, Epaphroditus. He must have grown up in a pagan home um, with parents who named their son after this popular idol. Um, it's interesting to see that we have a pattern. We have Paul, then Timothy, and finally, at the last um, of the passage, the end, Epaphroditus. We have a Hebrew of Hebrews, then we have a half-Gentile, you know, kind of half-Jew, and then we have a full-blooded Hellenistic Gentile. Nevertheless, it is here that Paul uses Epaphroditus as the last example of someone who lives out the gospel of salvation. We don't know too much about him as he's only explicitly mentioned twice in the Bible with both occurrences here in Philippians. Today we will look at somebody who went all in for the work of Christ, someone who risked even his life in obedience and servitude to his heavenly master. Let's look at verse 25. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. With every definition, Epaphroditus is portrayed as this critical player in the ministry. Notice the conjugations, brother and worker and soldier, also messenger and minister. It's all or nothing, and the order does matter. First, Epaphroditus was a believer, a brother in Christ. A regenerated soul who has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and entered into God's family. Only then can Epaphroditus be a fellow worker, not only in the same family, but in the same field. Paul can labor and toil with a co-worker in the faith, slaving away to bear good and plentiful, plentiful fruit for the Master. After serving together comes fighting together. I have your back and you have mine. See, Paul and Epaphroditus are in the same foxhole, the same firefight. 
Paul and Epaphroditus are fighting against the world, the flesh and the devil, defending the faith. And not only is Epaphroditus all these things to Paul, but he is also a messenger and minister to the church, Christians in Philippi as messenger and minister, proclaiming the good news and spreading the message. That was Epaphroditus. And yet, there's no sign that Epaphroditus is any more than just your average churchgoer. While it was likely he served as uh, part of the ch church leadership and back in Philippi, there's no explicit mention that this church member is simply someone who embodied what it means to be a servant of God, living out salvation, a servant of Christ. And one way we can see just how dedicated Epaphroditus is, is by looking at just the distance and the travel he made all the way from the town of Philippi to the church and city of Rome. And a minimum of 800 miles as the bird flies was in between. To make such a trek would require walking across the country of Macedonia, traveling across the Adriatic or Ionian Sea, and then hiking halfway across Italy. Assuming everything went well, a trip like this would take two months. If you thought our mail can be slow, if the Church of Philippi had sent the offering Express or Epaphroditus, it still would have taken more than a single month. So why did Paul think it was necessary to send him back? I mean, he just made this whole trip, he delivered the offering, and now Paul is saying, I'm going to send him back. Why? And it's not only just that he is sending him back, he sees it as absolutely necessary. This necessary is a strong word in the creek. Verse 26, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. Paul thought it was absolutely necessary, critically vital that Epaphroditus was sent back. Why? Because he was longing for you, distressed. It was clear that Philippi held a special place in the heart of Epaphroditus. This evidently godly man was beside himself or stressed out because the Philippians heard that he was sick. Now, don't get me wrong, but to me, that seems like a not really good reason to be beside yourself. Typically when I get sick, I... I'm kind of ashamed to admit, I enjoy the empathy. I, I like people feeling bad for me when I have my sniffles. Okay? So why is Epaphroditus so concerned, so distressed? This word is almost the, to the same degree as Jesus when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Absolutely distraught. This is, was Epaphroditus. He had a heart for Christ. Like David, a man after God's own heart, 1 Samuel 13, 14. He didn't want any pity. He didn't want to distress or trouble his brothers and sisters in Christ. Turn to Philippians 4, 18. It might give us some context. Chapter 4, verse 18. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. This man was wholehearted in his service, willing to do whatever he could to help. His heart overflowed with love because Christ had so helped him at first. We love because he first loved us. Paphroditus loved the Philippians dearly as well as Paul, but his love was from Christ and we need to see that today. Christ is the source of his humble, sacrificing service. The Christians in Philippi had sent Epaphroditus, and they sent him as a mail carrier who would deliver the Philippians' offering and serve Paul however he could. Epaphroditus didn't want to let them down. And so what did he do? Well, we see he risked his life while he was on his deathbed. Knocking at death's door with one foot in the grave, Epaphroditus is more concerned that the Philippians would be worried about him and that they would be concerned or that they would be okay while he was gone. Look at the next verse, verse 27. For indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him 
and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. This word sick literally means without strength. This is a man who gave it everything he got. This is a man who dedicated his entire life to the gospel. He had almost no regard for his own well-being, it seems. The only thing on Epaphroditus' mind was the work of Christ. Even if it meant he gave his own life, he was staking all his chips in the Lord's hands, so to say. Why? Because when we place our hope and trust in God, it's no longer a gamble, but it's a guarantee. A guarantee. Listen to Philippians chapter 1. Verse 20. Halfway through the passage, with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose. This was Paul talking and it was evidently in the same heart as Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus is content in the Lord, only concerned about others, not focused on self. Nevertheless, God did not have to heal Epaphroditus. We have to see that. It's the only way we can really appreciate it. He didn't deserve to stay on this earth any more than the rest of us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23. Amen. We only have a short time on earth. It is quite short. The house always wins, so to say. Any time here on earth is for service. After that, if you are a Christian, it is eternal pleasure and <coughs> communion with your Lord. And yet, by God's will and good desire, God determined to heal Epaphroditus out of mercy. Not only just for Epaphroditus, but mercy for others. We have such a glory waiting on the other side, it almost makes you wonder what Epaphroditus may have wanted. If I wanted what was best for me, I'd be looking for every opportunity to enter into those pearly gates to meet my Lord. But in the meantime, Christ has put me on this earth, and He won't take me a second after until I've fulfilled everything that He wants me to do here in service, in devotion, in love. God also had mercy on Paul as this sorrow upon sorrow depicts wave after wave of sadness, grief, and heartache. The Philippians felt the same. They couldn't bear the loss of such a good friend. Grief is real, but the Lord allows trials in our lives so we are drawn closer to Him. And it's important to note that He doesn't put a trial on us that we aren't able to bear. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10.13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And before I read this, it's important to note that the Greek word temptation can also be translated as trial. Simply put, temptation is whenever our faith is put to the test. Now let's read. No temptation or trial, you could say, has overtaken you but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted or tested beyond what you are able, but with the temptation or test will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. God knew exactly how much sorrow Paul could handle and always provides a way, a way for Christians that we can endure. Love, endurance, and service. These are three things that Scripture is trying to show us and is using Epaphroditus as an example, a relatable role model to show us how it's done. Christians are loving, humble, servants of others. Christ was more concerned for others than himself. We should be no different. Are you a brother or sister? A fellow worker? A fellow soldier? Are you a messenger, a minister? Are you a Christian? Matthew 16, 24 through 25. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 
We say we follow Christ, but we often forget that He was headed straight to the cross in complete self-denial, totally focused on God and on others. Epaphroditus was exactly that, totally at disregard of any personal well-being, all in, serving in the Lord. Be like Him. Be like Christ. Verse 28, Therefore I have sent Him all the more eagerly, so that when you see Him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. Note the word, therefore. Oftentimes it helps when you're reading the Bible. Uh, when you see this word, therefore, you need to find out what it's there for. Why is that? It's because it's a connecting word. It's a connecting phrase. It connects two sentences together. Just before this, Paul was describing how great of a servant Epaphroditus was. Fellow minister, fellow messenger, fellow soldier, fellow brother, fellow worker. And yet... Paul says that he needs to send Epaphroditus, and he's going to do it gladly. That's kind of bizarre. And evidently, we see that he carried this epistle of Philippians with him, Epaphroditus. But why? I thought Epaphroditus was a great guy. Why is Paul sending him away? Is it just to get rid of him? No. It was not because of anything Epaphroditus did. But because his heart was so distraught over the Philippians, it would be a violation of his conscience to stay. And the Philippians, distressed over Epaphroditus, and Paul almost grieving over Epaphroditus, and vice versa. And it's just this circle of sorriness and, you know, distraught sorrow. It was just a sorry situation. So we see that Paul had to send Epaphroditus. With Epaphroditus feeling better, no one could rest until the Philippian brethren knew about it, until they could be comforted. Everyone needed to rejoice, taking joy that he was healed and that God is in control. This type of love should indwell every single believer. It's a love so strong it will break your heart. It's a love so deep that you will travel 800 miles miles to serve your family. It's a love so full that you can risk everything you have in the pursuit of the service of others and still have more than enough. Do you have that type of love? As a Christian, we can only have this type of love when we are given it by Christ. Like a contagious virus, we only become infected with the love of Christ when we are in His presence, when we are near Him. When we experience His love for us, you want to be cured of selfishness? You feel like you've grown cold? Get Christ. Get that treatment. The treatment of His love. At least try to understand how much He cares about you. The directions for this treatment, I thought about, you know, a pill bottle. You turn it over to the back and you read chapter 2. It says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Take this truth daily, morning and night, and every other time of day for that matter. I promise you, if you can comprehend a fraction of how much God loves you, the rest will follow. Submit to His love today. Side effects may include, or rather will include, listen in chapter 2, encouragement in Christ, consolation of love, fellowship of the Spirit, affection, compassion, making joy complete, and uniting in my love, spirit, and purpose with other God-centered Christians. It's like those advertisements, you know, it's almost like the side effects are greater than the actual treatment. It's like, what? No. That's exactly what we see here. When we have this love of Christ, when we have this simple service and heart, everything else comes out of it. Turn to Matthew 26, 40. One way we can serve others, I know it's not easy, okay? I'm not claiming that I can accomplish this on my own accord, and I pray none of you get that from the service. What I am saying is that when you serve others, you have to focus on service to Christ. It is only when you pursue Christ that others are provided for. Matthew 26, 40. The context of this passage is Jesus is, um, has, it's the end of days, and everybody is lined up. And then he turns to the Christians, and he says, The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent you did it to one of these brothers of mine, that is Christians, even the least of them, 
You did it to me. And then, of course, he turns to the unbelievers in the last days. And later, in verse 45, he says, Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Those, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. If you want to know how you can have that love, like Epaphroditus, like Paul, like Timothy, like Christ, it is only by looking at the love that God has for us. Love God, love others. And one of the best ways, one of the primary ways that we fulfill that command is we love God by loving others. We love others by loving God. It's one command. Verse 29. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard. We often ask our kids, any kids really, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, you know, you might look into their lives and ask, you know, what role models do you look up to? Whether it's a pop artist, whether it's, I don't know. It may seem like an odd question at maybe this stage in your life. Some of you may think you're beyond that aspect, beyond the aspiration of something greater in maturity. Beyond that, maybe you just feel too old to have role models. Well, let me tell you, Scripture is giving you some today, and we need to see you may think you are beyond this, but role models aren't just for six-year-olds or 16-year-olds, but 60-year-olds. Whether we are adding inches to our height or to our belt size, we are all still growing, hopefully in maturity. Turn to Ephesians 4, 12 through 13. God gives ministers, and until we all attain, here's, here I quote, to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. If the standard of maturity is Jesus, we all have a long way to go, let me assure you. Paul is urging the Philippians to receive their Christian brother, to think of him more highly than ever, and rejoicing to still have him. And following his example. But notice the words, in the Lord. Receive him then in the Lord. This is important. Epaphroditus is but only a poor copy. A poor copy of the real thing. Someone we can relate to who has faults just like our own. Who may not be all that prominent. Who we can relate to. Who we can imitate. Who we can say, hey, that guy's just like me. Serving in the Lord who though he may not be perfect, though he may not be notable, and though he's mentioned only once in, in the Bible, he's given his heart to Christ, his whole heart, his whole service, his whole life. Paul, Timothy, all these men, all their efforts, all their suffering, risking life and limb, are but earthly role models, mere examples to follow. Someone we can imitate. Their lives were changed. Not because of their own, you know, pulling themselves up by the bootstraps and, okay, I'm going to do it. No. No. It was Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus, these guys. They dedicated them, their lives to the pursuit of Jesus Christ and to serve in such a manner that it might reflect His servitude. To serve others in the same sense, in the same ways, in the same love that Christ served us. Matthew 20, 16. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. No one is going to get it perfect. But I'm here to tell you, you don't have to. Christ was perfect and lived the perfect life on your behalf. If you think it's of your own doing, it's your own standard that you can stay in here today and say, I'm a good Christian servant. No. That, that would be totally missing the point. Totally missing the passage. It is only when we look to Christ that we can imitate that, that we can achieve that. Christ humbled himself into his own fallen creation and lived his entire life here on earth serving others. 
In fact, Jesus was perfectly obedient to his Father's will, knowing it would cost him his life. All for the interests of others. Dying to save sinful men, he lives again to make them holy, to make them pure, so that we might live in service and sacrifice. All in. He loves you wholeheartedly. We need to be the same way. All in. Risking it all. No holds barred. Becoming a humble servant. And the key to that is to look to Christ. I can't stress this point enough. The heart of the matter is your heart. Now, the question is, does it belong to yourself and your own pursuits and your own interests? Or does it belong to Christ? Does He own it? Does He own you? Let's look at our last verse. Verse 30. Because He came close to death for the work of Christ, risking His life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Paul determines that the cause of illness or near-death experience of Epaphroditus is his passion, is ultimately the work of Christ. That's what nearly killed him. Like he was so on fire for Christ, you could almost watch him burst into flames if you waited long enough. Epaphroditus had a bad case of Christianitis, servitude syndrome. Spiritual cardiac arrest and hyperempathy disorder. A disease so severe that it stops you in your tracks and you put all others above yourself and it threatens your life. A truly life-changing illness. Oh, that we would be infected with this chronic, lifelong Christ-likeness. That we would spend the rest of our days in the pursuit of Christ and serving others. Love God, love others. The only treatment is to break down before the Lord and die to yourself. It's also important that Paul in this passage isn't like being passive-aggressive or making some backhanded compliment. Oh yeah, Epaphroditus, he's this great guy. He came close to the death, but risking his life and what you didn't do. I mean, I know you guys couldn't do it. No, that's not what he's saying, okay? He's not being spiteful. He's simply acknowledging that their service and love for Paul, back in the Christians in Philippi, would have never made it to Paul if it wasn't for Epaphroditus to lay his life down practically and deliver it to him. The offering, the service, the love. The truth is, if it wasn't for the compensating service of this Christian, we may not have this letter today, this book this important book that now that it's here in our hands and before us today, we need to reflect what it is in it. And right now, it is the example of Epaphroditus. It is the example of Christ. And it is a lifelong service to others and to our Lord. No matter how may, much we may mean well, unless our boots are on the ground, serving others and denying ourselves, we are as whitewashed tombs, as Christ said full of dead man's bones. We may look pretty, but we stink of our rotten selves. Forget putting your back into it. Put your heart into it. Put your whole being into it. Christ died for you, yes? Why, why would you not give your everything in return? It's no longer a gamble. He is guaranteed salvation and eternal life if you only place your bed in Him. I urge you today to check your selfishness out at the door today and take home someone infinitely greater than yourself. We must come to a place where we acknowledge our own failures, our own sins, our own selfishness. Matthew 23, 12. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. As the ladies come up, I want to let you know that place, that place of repentance, that place where you realize that you've grown cold, that you're not enough, that you may have turned away from Christ and you've headed your own way long enough, that place is here. None of us have a guarantee of next month, next week, tomorrow, or even the drive home. 
After demonstrating example after example after example of what it means to be a Christian, I ask you, do you live in the Lord? Do you live for the Lord? Do you have godly examples in your life that you can strive to emulate? Do you hold men like these in high regard, aiming to improve yourself continually, to lower yourself all the more, and to dive deeper into humility? Chasing after Christ Jesus, who has served ahead of you, Do you receive this message today, holding it in your heart, letting the Word of God weigh on you to convict you and make a change? Or do you reject the path of salvation, the path of servitude, the path of Christ? If you know the answer to these questions, but you may not like the answers, or if you don't like them, repent. That's what repentance is. It's heading one way and making a complete 180 to Christ, focusing totally on Him, forgetting yourself, forgetting others, and focusing on Him. And it is only when you look to Christ that you can love God, that you can love others, that everything else flows. Do we see that? Stop pursuing your own glory and work for His. We all need to be better, better at loving others, better at serving others. And that starts by looking at better Christians, looking at Christ Jesus Himself, our Lord. Only then can we be saved from sin, from ourselves, and live for something greater. Live for Christ. You can bet on that. Let's pray. Dear Jesus God, we come to you today, before you, acknowledging that we are not enough in and of ourselves. And that we so often fail you, and that we so often become wrapped up in our own lives. Lord, let us realize that our own selves, that's death. And that the first will be last. And that if we place and pursue our own desires above all others, we will fall. And Lord, let us see that it is you. When we understand just a fraction of how much you love us, when we understand just how much you've done for us, when we understand the sacrifice that you paid for with your own blood, when we understand that, that is when we unlock Christ-likeness. When we have been changed deeply at a heart level. When we understand in the innermost part of our being that you are Lord and that we are your servants and that our whole purpose and mission in life is to glorify God and enjoy him forever and to serve you, to love God and love others. Let, us, let this be our purpose in life. Let us forget everything else, our own passions, our own desires, our own dreams, our own lottery tickets. Let us focus on you, solely on you, betting everything we have on you. Lord, we give it to you today, all in. Let us come before you today. The ladies won't be playing us out today, but they will be playing some music, and they will allow us to have a heartfelt moment a time in our life where we can deny ourselves and we can make a commitment to you to pursue you. So Lord, I ask in the next few minutes as the music plays that you change our hearts, that this message is convicting to the heart and that we see just how much we've served ourselves to commit to serving you. I ask you to keep your head bowed and you rest in the peace of the moment and you give it all to Christ. All in. Amen.
you guys for coming today I just ask as you leave these doors today that you dedicate your lives whatever you time you have left to loving God and loving others and putting it all on the table in service to him may the Lord keep you may he bless you and may his face shine upon you you guys have a good week <laughs>